Amen. Amen. Well, nice to see most of you. I've only met a few of you. So uh, my name is Colton. I'm from uh, originally Phoenix. Went to school in LA just to give you a little bit of who I am. Uh, I'm Sicilian American. You'll probably hear that come up a lot. Um, my roommate can attest. I love pizza, love basketball. Um, so we intersect there. Any of his interests, just let me know. Uh, I'd love to do both those at the same time even. Um, so we're going to actually be, <laughs> we, we have the wrong passage actually on the paper, uh, which is not a big deal. We have cell phones and technology, um, so we can do it. Uh, but we're going to be in Matthew 5. You don't have to pull out your phone and read it. I can read it for us. Um, but we're going to be in Matthew 5. Um, and then it's Matthew 538. I don't know if anyone is turning there. Um, I'll give you a second to get there, though. No, it's about taxes, <laughs> which would be a fun message in itself. It's about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. Yeah. No worries. Everyone should. I mean, if you've spent some time in the word, you'll probably know this passage. So it's not a big deal. But all right, Matthew 5, verse 38. Um, it says, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants, you, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and to not, do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So we'll stop there. We're going to keep reading it in a little bit. Um, but Caleb and Deanna have been taking us through kind of generally after the last year, working through like what it means to be a disciple and what are the practices of a disciple, what are the characters of a disciple. Um, and so tonight we're focusing uh, mostly on enemy love as one of the things that it looks like for uh, being a disciple. Um, but as with all teaching, we want it to be more conversational. Um, so does anyone know, and granted you don't, may not have it in front of you, but does anyone know where that phrase came from? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's actually from two places. It's from the Code of Hammurabi, which you guys might not know who that is. It's an ancient uh, Near Eastern kind of ruler, and also from Leviticus 24. Um, so does anyone know why that was like a remarkable thing? It's kind of like one of their laws, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, limited, uh, and limited retribution. So yeah. You didn't kill a person for fucking your eye. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's exactly it. That's exactly right. So uh, there's this, it's kind of called like a law of reciprocity. Um, and that's the hope of the time is that it's an eye for an eye. Because sometimes back in the olden days, we don't do this anymore because we're all more civil, sure. But in the olden days, back then, sometimes there'd be like an offense, like I poked you in the eye. And since there was no laws or no rules, people would just murder each other uh, for no good reason. So this code came into place, and it's in the Old Testament, to try to limit... <laughs> basically justice to the right punishment. Um, so it wasn't like over excessive punishment. And so something that's cool that Jesus is doing in this greater, I mean, if, you, if you've read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he's kind of taking these sayings, like you've heard it was said this, and then he says something else about it. So that is our, you've heard it was said, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But then the next line, he says, but I tell you, so he's, he's either expounding or changing what the first one is. He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. I know for me, when I hear that, like, do not resist an evil person, I'm assuming that word resist means to, like, just sit there and just take <laughs> whatever an evil person is going to do to you. That's not what this word means. Um, it's not really a good English translation. It basically means don't violently oppose an evil, evil person, i.e. in the same way when it's eye for an eye. So when someone pokes you in the eye, don't violently oppose them in the same way and hit them in their eye. So he's basically kind of, in some ways, taking this frame of eye for an eye and saying there's actually a higher calling here. That was almost like a baseline, and now we're going to a higher level of calling here. Um, and so when you think of this, like, law of reciprocity, again, I haven't been in many fights in my life. Um, I, I don't like being punched in the face. I don't know if anyone can relate with that. Um, but there was this one time when I was in middle school. I was in my pantry in my parents' house, um, and my buddy, Zach, uh, he was, like, going for some chips. But then I grabbed the chips first, and so then he slapped me in the back of the head. And so what did you do? you naturally, then I slap him in the face. And then he like looked at me like stunned, like why'd you slap me in the face? And then he slapped me in the face. And then I slapped him in the face and I ran. And so what happened was the next literally five minutes, we were slapping each other in the face across the room, like dancing around, it's like playing tag. Like you get your slap in, it's like, okay, we're done. 
He's like, no, we're not, and slap you again. So the whole point of what, how we kind of operate as humans, and obviously we're not slapping each other, that is kind of our dynamic. I mean, if you think of like how we interact, oh, it's that person said that thing on social media in that way about my argument about who I am. Well, I'm gonna I'm clap back. I'm gonna hit them back right where they hit me. Uh, that person cut me off in traffic. Well, I'm gonna cut them off. I'm gonna do some, uh, I'm gonna pump my brakes a little bit. <laughs> Make sure they know. We, we still as humans do this, maybe not to the grand scheme of like, if you murder me, I murder you or something like that. But we still kind of practice the law of reciprocity in some ways. We always want to get equal. We want to get even. It's kind of how we think and how we work. And again, that's better than like getting revenge, which is what the first passage was talking about. Um, but Jesus is calling us to something higher. So this is what he says to do. He gets, kind of gives some examples. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Does anyone know, like, wh what does that mean? Why would he say that? Why would that be his first example? If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, give to them the other also. I mean, we all know the phrase, turn the other cheek, but why, why that? There's no wrong answers, but there's more right answers. Isn't there an uh, ultimate sign of disrespect? Yeah. So basically what, what John Caleb is saying, like, turn to the person next to you and pretend like you're going to slap them on the right cheek. Okay, so look at the person. I need you to actually look at the person next to you. How would you do that? Remember, your left hand, ancient times, you can't use your left hand because you use that to wipe your butt. You don't use that for those kind of things. So you only use your right hand for insults and for slapping. How would you be able to slap them on the right cheek? You can't do it this way. You have to do it this way. And so literally in Jesus's time, there was fines for slapping people on the cheek. <laughs> um, if you slap someone this way, it was like a certain fine. If you slap someone this way, it's four times that fine. Because the only people that slap this way is if you're slapping an inferior. So it was kind of a class distinction. So what Jesus is saying is when someone slaps you this way as an inferior, you turn the other cheek to them. Why, why would you do that? What do you think he's, he's getting at here? Other than just obviously not returning with violence. But what is he, what is he kind of doing with that? It's okay if you don't know. It's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So basically, you think of that. When I'm slapping you this way, it makes you an inferior. But if I slap you this way, it's an equal. It's an equal kind of slap or equal footing for slapping each other. So when you turn the other cheek, he either has to stop his violence towards you or he has to slap you like an equal. And so it's taking this person who slapped you, who's treating you, who's insulting you like an inferior. And Jesus is saying, since we don't violently oppose, we're not being passive, but we're actively kind of flipping these things on its head. And so when I'm doing this way, when I turn this way, he has two options. Continue with his violence, but treat me as an equal or stop the violence, which are both things that is a sin. It's humiliating him in the public sphere because he's trying to humiliate you. So that's the first thing. It's yes. It's not clear whether, like, what, what cheek he's hitting first or she's hitting first, right? Is, that, is it? Uh, it says the right cheek. Does it say it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the wrong translation. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's in the right cheek. But even if it, even if it isn't, it, it, there's still some of the, yeah, the dynamic yeah, no, I at like play. That. I was like, you can flip it either way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Yeah, because then you're making them treat you as an inferior if it's the other way, depending exactly. on the cheeks are. Yeah, of course. Um, next line. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. What, what do you guys think that means? Someone wants to sue you, <laughs> take your shirt. Also give them your coat. That's true. That's true. That is an aspect of it. <laughs> you already got the coat off to give the shirt. <laughs> uh what else do you guys know what, what was like for those of you who may know what was maybe the the garb of ancient times do you guys know what their garb was their clothing their attire robe. a robe yeah yeah so everyone wore robes that's the that's the coat they're talking about so you say that again like a tunic. exactly that's the shirt the tunic so you basically had two articles of clothing you had your tunic underneath which is kind of like your underwear in some ways and then you had a robe on the outside which was your coat um, and for, for people who are poor, robes would be kind of what you sleep in. Uh, it kind of functioned in, in multiple ways. And so in this time period, um, sometimes when you owned a debt to someone, they could literally sue you if you couldn't pay for it and take your underwear, your shirt, your tunic. <laughs> like, think of like, think of that as like, if you're going to court, you owe someone something. And they have, and because of the legal system, they have so much authority that they can literally take the clothes right off your back. 
So what Jesus is doing here, uh, look at it again. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, take your tunic, take your underwear, offer your coat, your robe as well. What does that leave you with as a person? What are you wearing now? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, so imagine being in a court type system. Someone's trying to oppress you by being over the top and suing you, trying to take your underwear. And Jesus says, if they take your underwear, give them your coat as well, because nakedness in this culture would humiliate. It's humiliating to make someone naked. And so again, if you look at do not like resist an evildoer, again, it's not passiveness, um, but it's this way of kind of flipping things on its head. It's, it's humiliating ourselves, which shows the, almost the, the wickedness of the person who's doing evil to you. But you're not doing evil back, but you're almost like entering into the evil in some ways to show, um, to kind of publicly, in a sense, humiliate them or show the error of their ways. Um, yeah, go for it. Just, I, I was hearing, uh, I, it, was, it was on like the daily or something. So they were talking about how MLK and especially the way that um, civil rights stuff happened in the 60s, the goal of nonviolent protest was to reflect, have people reflect back on, on uh, the violence that they had yeah. done. Yeah. And so you would intentionally draw out. Yeah. Like you, they would intentionally send like the kids to the front of the line. Yeah. So that when the dogs are attacking the kids, and so that they, so that there would be like this intentional vulnerability put out there mm -hmm. to get pictures to have society reflecting back on what it is they've done. Yeah. So it wasn't just like pure nonviolence. It was also like uh, it was intentionally showing what mm -hmm. to the people that are doing it. Yeah. By going that much. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. No, that's it's like, that's perfect. Really exactly the way that we're always doing. Uh, <laughs> like, like the social justice stuff these days. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that's the only way to mm -hmm. learn, mm -hmm. it is really interesting. Yeah. I like that it's tied to, you have to be willing to be a Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta go. You gotta yeah. go extra vulnerable for people to actually respond. You have to be like willing to get it even worse, yeah. in order to actually, in a sense, resist an evildoer in a way that's that's what Jesus is calling us to. That's good. That's a perfect example. Yeah. <laughs> Flush it out for us. <laughs> yeah, there's a proverb that's that's yeah. like um. Yeah. Uh, when you, you're good to your enemy or feed your enemy or something and you'll yeah, you'll keep, like yeah. it's not you're not actually keeping hold on their head but it's like by being doing good it exposes yeah yeah it's it's a similar i mean you can jesus is not necessarily doing anything new in the new testament a lot of it he's actually more fully showing what god's plan and hopes have been all along um but he does it in ways that are counteracting the the ways of the time all right uh let's go to the next line if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Um, I'm sure we've all heard, go the extra mile. It's like when you're working out or something. <laughs> uh, but what, it, what do you guys think this actually means? Uh, it's not about just working out two miles instead of one mile. This, this one I have heard in a lot yeah. of sermons. It's the Romans would, uh, they had to carry heavy armor, the soldiers. And so they would like find some random citizen and say, carry my armor for one mile or something. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. So in, in this time period, I mean, they're under Roman rule. Roman soldiers could find a Jewish citizen um, or anyone who wasn't a Roman citizen and basically force them to carry their pack, like their heavy pack for a mile. It was kind of just a part of uh, the jurisdiction of the Roman rules. So when Jesus said, and Jew, like Jewish people hated this. And as you can imagine, have you ever carried a heavy pack for a mile? I personally haven't. That sounds awful. Uh, backpacking this summer, but you're getting forced to do it in the desert of uh, Jerusalem. And so the Jewish people hated this. Hated it. This is like, there were zealots. If you guys know zealots of the time, there were certain Jews that hated how Rome was ruling Israel. They started killing Roman soldiers on site. Like the, the, their code was, if you ever saw a Roman soldier, they are so far gone, you kill them on site. Now, obviously, I'm not advocating for that, but that is just to show you how much the people hated this kind of jurisdiction. 
Um, and so what does Jesus say? <laughs> he says, offer to walk an extra mile. Because imagine, imagine what that does to the Roman soldier who's being petty, who's being over aggressive, who's being an authoritarian. Um, you're, you're in some ways you're shaming them by, by like willing to go undergo hardship or vulnerability. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, Oh, you really need me to take this one mile. Okay. I'll take it two for you. Um, it's this beautiful, again, it's this flipping again. I, I can't even like with MLK stuff. I, I don't know if I could naturally in who I am, just think of how to like actively resist evil in these kind of beautiful ways. Cause normally we just go eye for eye, <laughs> tooth for tooth. Um, so that, that's kind of what we're, we're sitting on here. We're going to keep on going. Um, but again, these are, these are three layers of personal insults. The first one on the cheek, that is a, a higher class to lower class insult. The second one is probably like equal class neighbor to neighbor type of insult. They're oversuing you. You're in debt to someone. They're oversuing you. The third one is an empire insult. So it's three ways of really false, bad laws and justice that Jesus is asking us to step into in a way that is radically different than what is happening in culture. Um, so uh, let's keep on moving on. Um, can you guys, before we get go on, can you guys think of any, I mean, Caleb just brought up one, but can you think of any modern examples that kind of match or mirror what Jesus is asking here? Obviously, we're not asked to carry a, a Roman soldier's pack <laughs> for a mile, so we don't get to just directly live this out. Dom's got something in his head. Kind of, yeah. Like, I guess I just do feel like this sums up, like, and maybe it's not like a shaming thing, but it is like a, it makes the person, like, self-reflect and take a step back and, like, look within themselves and realize, like, I don't want to be doing what I'm doing anymore kind of thing. So, yeah. I guess like at my job, I'm a, I'm a school counselor and mm -hmm. like oftentimes if a parent's frustrated, they'll come in like really hot, you know, like, mm. <laughs> and wanting, like clearly they came in to like go to yeah. a verbal assault war with who they're frustrated with. And when you just listen, they're like, it like instantly de-escalates them mm. because I feel like they realize like they didn't, they don't need to the way they're acting so i feel like yeah. that's a yeah. less violent example but like yeah. the idea of someone verbally or like in a fight with a spouse or whatever um like when, when someone comes in like really verbally hot yeah and then you just listen and they like it stops that yeah well and imagine like i imagine that moment dom what an ego hit in some ways because maybe you, you're justified maybe you're right and what an ego hit it takes to like have to just take that, <laughs> just like and take it and absorb it and apologize for something you might have actually be apologetic for. That's good. What else? Yeah. Realization, but that's not always the case. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. Retaliatory nature. Yeah. What's going on inside? Even if the actions look like the right mode, what's going on inside? How are you feeling about it? Yeah. Yeah. I could imagine there's a, a Jewish listener listening to this and immediately runs out. The next time they get asked to carry that Roman pack for a mile, they're like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to carry it two miles. And the Roman soldiers are just like, great, carry it too. <laughs> so I can imagine how like mad they'd be inside realizing this isn't, isn't, this isn't necessarily solving uh, the evilness of people. I think you could, uh, I think we could also look at it, uh, Conversely, not not really towards the transgressor, but yeah. towards yourself, uh, or being oppressed or moved by someone else's, you know, control of violence or insult. Uh, I feel like maybe Jesus is sort of offering a like a view of being free from the retaliatory nature hmm. of violence and insult. Where yeah. if somebody hits you, you know, for you to offer is is, is it shocking, but it also means that you're not taking being hit as the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. you have or you're to not 
<laughs> yeah, if you keep doing it every week, eventually, you know, you can walk three miles, maybe four. But it, it's strength in such a upside down way. It's like this internal strength. It's not like what we think of in some ways. And that, we're gonna hit on that. <laughs> we're gonna get there. I got something cool there. Um, but I mean, just imagine, like imagine like the next time, you know, you accidentally cut someone off in traffic. There's this on the five right here. Uh, all right, it's that way near my house. Like there's this pot you get on. We cut someone off the other day, if you remember. It's like a yield thing. You can't tell when someone's coming. And you actually sometimes cut people off. And, oh, my gosh, Seattle drivers sometimes want to let you have it. Um, so, like, they're honking their horn, flipping you off. What if you, like, went up to them at the next light or whatever it is and just rolled down your window and said, you know what? Like, I I'm an idiot. Like, I'm so sorry that, like, I, I totally wasn't thinking, wasn't aware. Like, you're right to be upset. You're right to be mad. <laughs> yeah, you would. Yeah, oh, 100. percent They're not gonna like. I'm not saying what the response is gonna be, but that could be more of where we're at, where it's just we're just owning it. Um, in the ways you can't even like in, in fighting with a partner. Have you ever had like a you know one of those texts or one of those things where it's like, hey, can we talk later? And then they show up and they're just heated. You've clearly done something wrong. Maybe you haven't even done something wrong. What would it be like for you to not have to like protect your honor or protect your pride and just be able to like let them know that you're sorry and just take it um that is kind of what jesus is saying instead of protecting your honor instead of protecting your ego instead of protecting your pride because like you were saying it's it actually dwells somewhere else our security we can actually do these kind of things obviously not perfectly we're gonna get into that um but that that is kind of what he's trying to hit at here because you can see someone who's doing this stuff clearly their identity is not <laughs> in some of these things that we normally retaliate in clearly it's originated somewhere else now um so let's let's yeah, keep going. Not, oh yeah, go for it. Say, um, like one of the things also somebody was talking about choice earlier. Like it also takes away the black and white thinking around hmm. a given situation, right? So like I for an eye is super black and white, right? You have a, 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 an immediate consequence. Yeah. If you have choice in a given situation for how the, how you respond to the situation, like Adam was saying, disarm it or going an extra mile, um, you have a you have a choice to to flip it flip the power structure on its head or change the power structure. So that there's a there's more of a uh, I don't know what's the word like a gradient for how for how we look at these situations and it's not a, an immediate like uh, reciprocal response. It's like hey let's let's change the paradigm so we're all thinking about this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A lot yeah. of people, you know, uh, even if it's not necessarily an evil person who ends up striking or the insulting, or you know, it's sort of just to think of them as a troubled person uh a lot of times that like the vitriol or the violence is expecting or is relying it, it can only exist <laughs> with the retaliation that then justifies you know yeah. somebody's uh, attack or yeah assault. and then uh it gives it you know allows that person to think that you know these are the rules that can be played mm -hmm. by and i'm right to continue to do this yeah because it's now been done to me but yeah. even if you don't change the person's mind like you still change the game yeah Mm -hmm. I mean, have you all ever been on Twitter? <laughs> like even some of those bots on Twitter, they're just, they're wanting you to engage in the paradigm he's talking about, this evil for evil, evil, this eye for eye, this tooth for tooth. They want that. They're expecting that. It validates them being evil when you respond with evilness. So you change the paradigm when you respond in a different way. Um, Do you guys think it's worth trying to change the vibe of Twitter? 
I don't know. I don't know. Because uh, I, I think if I look at Christian responses to any spheres of public communication or public, you know, interacting, there's people that choose to reform it, that try to stay in it, reform it, people who choose to leave it, <laughs> and people who choose to indulge in it. Um, and I think we probably find all three of ourselves interacting with that in some ways um, within it. I don't know which one's the most faithful, probably not indulging, <laughs> but maybe somewhere else. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, let's read the next part because that's kind of the precursor to, I think, this next little spot he hits on here. Because um, he kind of hits it even harder. So this is Matthew 5. Again, after that, I think this is starting 43. Um, I will read it. It says, you have heard that it was said, love your enemy and ha- or love, <laughs> love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be called children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise in the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Does anyone know where this little you've heard it was said phrase comes from because he had the first one eye for an eye two for three does anyone know where this one comes from this one's actually not in the bible yeah 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 so yeah it, it's just like there's this whole jewish world with the midrash all these things where rabbis are basically adding to the scriptures to help us live it more faithfully it's not in a, a malicious way um and so they're asking okay love your love your neighbor okay well who is my neighbor uh well it's not my enemy and if i have to choose between loving my neighbor or loving my enemy who do i choose and the kind of the consensus of the time was you choose to love your neighbor that was kind of the thing um and even led to some phrases of love your neighbor and hate your enemy and so jesus is kind of hitting on that here um but then he obviously again he takes it but i tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you um, and so I've mentioned this before, uh, but this is actually this line right here, Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is the most quoted passage or teaching of Jesus in the early church, uh, like pre 400 AD. This is the most quoted passage by pastors, elders, uh, early church fathers, et cetera, et cetera. It's not John three 16. <laughs> it's not Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, it's this love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, because I think for a lot of the early church, they knew that this was the most, probably one of the most radical teachings of Jesus. This was the most radical way they could look distinctively different than everyone around them. Um, cause think about it, even in like America where we have a lot of good moralism for the most part, um, in certain areas, what is, I, I still think we don't do this well at all. We could do some other things. Well, some other things that Jesus maybe taught well, but this one, uh, uh-uh. and I don't think any civilization <laughs> does this well. Um, so this is kind of, this is the big one. Um, and so let's dive in a little bit to this word love. Do you guys know the Greek words for love? I'm sure if you've sat in church, you've heard a pastor <laughs> hit you over the head, maybe with the different Greek words for love. It's okay if you haven't, uh, it's not a big deal, but there was, there's a few different words for love in Greek. Obviously in English, we only have one word for love. It's love. Um, but even think of like, Hey, I love you, Caleb. It's very different than me talking to the, like a, a spouse saying, I love you. And talking to like, I love, I love pancakes. <laughs> but can you tell, even like in our language, it's the same word, but there's three different meanings. Uh, so the Greek just actually had three different words to describe those different things. And so this love is agape love, which I'm sure maybe some of you have heard. It's a common phrase. And it's basically, it's a love that's committed to action. It's not a love that's based on feeling. It's a love that actually leads to you doing something. Um, this is committal love. Um, some would call it maybe unconditional love. 
uh, but it, it's more committal love. And so when Jesus says, love your enemies, he's not saying like them. He's not saying feel good about them. He's saying seek the goodwill of your enemies because it's love and action. And that's like, in some ways, that might be a sigh of relief because you're like, man, if I have to like my enemies, count me out. But in other ways, that might even be a step harder because you actually have to seek good for them. You can't just ignore them. You can't just avoid them. You have to seek the goodwill of your enemies um, and pray for those who persecute you. That's tough. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, for me, that's pretty hard. Um, and so I, I want to add a couple caveats. Um, but first, let's dive into one little thing here. But I'm going to add a couple caveats about love and enemies and what that looks like in our culture and our time. Um, but look at this next line. What does it say um, that we will be called if we love our enemies and uh, pray for those who persecute us? Does anyone have the passage open? What, what does it say that if we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, what will we be called? What will be known? What will be called? It's right there in that same line. Children of your father in heaven. So it says, if you, if you love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, do that so that you may be called children of your father in heaven. Um, so we're kind of detached in some ways in our modern times from this culture and from fatherhood in some ways, at least in the ancient historical way. But you were kind of known as a son of your father. That was kind of how you know it. It would be Colton, son of Vince. Uh, Naveen, son of Vinit. That was kind of like how you were known. You were expected to take on your father's trade. You were expected to reflect your father's character. You were supposed to be an image, uh, a likeness of your father. Um, I, I, I personally did not go into my father's trade of selling RVs, but that would be preposterous in this time in some ways. One, it might not even be able. You might not even be able to get out of your father's trade. So when you're the son of something in this time, when you're called sons of something, it means that you are reflecting the actual, like the absolute essence of what the father is. So if I am an RV salesman now, that means I'm reflecting my father. I'm accurately reflecting my father. That's what it would be. So in this one, for us to accurately reflect the father, in order to be called a son of the father in heaven, what does that mean for us in essence? What do we have to do? We have to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So there's something in the essence of God and the heart of God, the heart of the Father, that is intrinsically tied to loving the enemy. And that's why this is so radical. Um, because it means even if you want to be reflecting God, you have to love your enemy. Like that, that is just the command to be called sons and daughters of the King, of the Father, of the Lord, of Jesus. It means to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, which it also is, means... Well, please, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but like, it's also good news for the, for the enemies of God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's super gracious, right? Like, which, I mean, it's super radical. It's, it's not what you'd expect, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and we, I mean, in the scripture tells us we were once enemies of God. So we even see it in the fact that you can be called the son shows that God's heart of enemy love because he loved you as an enemy and now you've become an adopted son. And now you do the same thing to the enemies. Of the world. So there's, there's two caveats I want to add, because I think it's important because the sounds radical. It sounds dreamy, dreamy. I, I don't think uh, in terms of like enemies and loving enemies, I don't think that means that Jesus is desirous for us to stay in abuse or to stay in harmful situations. I don't think that's his hope or what he wants us to do. Um, I think there is some room here, even in how Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, even in the agape. It's if you can seek the goodwill of your enemy, do it. If you can't, though, pray for them. And so there are some situations where you may not be able to seek the goodwill because of the dynamic, because of your own health. That still might be a calling to pray for them, but I think that's an important caveat because I think sometimes it can be abuse to keep people in relationships and dynamics that Jesus' hope is not there. Um, so I want to make sure that's clear. Second, second caveat I want to add is that as a white, uh, straight Christian male myself, sometimes I got to realize my place in society might be more the role of the enemy and oppressor rather than the someone who's being afflicted and oppressed. So even we have to analyze our own hearts here that some people living in this country, whether culturally, racially, socioeconomic, their enemies are much stronger, much harder than my enemies might be. Their calling of Jesus, their cross they have to carry is probably much bigger in some ways, at least it feels like, than mine. My cross is actually 
stepping out of being an oppressor and an enemy at times. And so there's a dynamic there as well. Um, we're not going to sit on that for too long, but that is something to just sit with in your own heart to weigh where you're at. Um, this is something we can even weigh culturally, like who are, who are the enemies we're afflicting as Americans? Is there something I'm consuming and buying that's causing uh, lower class or lower income people to walk two extra miles for my own good? Am I acting like a Roman soldier in some ways? Now, obviously, I'm not asking anyone to carry my pack. But there's certain things even that we partake in that are doing works of the enemy. And what's beautiful about this is that it's very clear that when Jesus is talking about loving your enemies, do all these things, turn the right cheek, whatever, it's, it's very clear that the stuff that those enemies are doing is blatantly wrong. So we should then be reflecting on, am I slapping anyone backhand? I'm looking down at anyone and slapping them, not treating them like an equal. Um, am I suing someone? Am I demanding more money back on certain things? Am I being, using my money in certain ways that's making me an enemy to the people around me? Um, and am I forcing people to work harder, labor harder because I want more comfort, luxury, whatever? Um, so that's just another caveat. Um, because there's probably a lot of people. That, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that's something maybe we could just dwell on for forever. Um, but one last thing before we go in, I want to split up, split up into groups in a second. But one last thing. When I hear phrases like this, when I work through this, even myself, like this is a tall task. Um, like being in America, I mean, guys, the last two years, the last four years, like there is enemies abroad that we have been afflicted maybe you have been hurt you've been harmed i got family members my grandparents are hardcore democrats my parents are hardcore republicans all of us kids are like independents we don't know because it's all chaos there are enemy lines everywhere if you look at america where it's going we're moving to more honor shame where so much stuff is polarizing pick a side choose a side that's honorable that's shameful this is good that's bad you're good you're bad and so there might be enemies in this room with some of us there might be enemies that are sit across our table that are in our families, not enemies in the, maybe the hard E enemy way, but in the soft E enemy because of some of our allegiances. Some of the things that we've been discipled by that haven't been the way of Jesus. Um, but the cool thing, the cool thing about all this, even though it's terrifying when that person comes in to your school counselor's office, when it's terrifying, the cool thing is that we can rest knowing that Jesus did this first. Anytime Jesus asks us to do something, he has already himself done it before us. He has shown us a pathway. And so going back to the cross, think of when Jesus walked down to Calvary. For those of you who know the story, what happened to him? Was he not slapped and whipped? Was he not stripped naked? Was he not forced to walk a mile carrying a cross, which is a big load, a big pack by the empire of Rome? And what did he do when he got up on the cross? And I mean, there's different accounts, but what, what was one of the things he did? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. He's praying while he's on the cross after he just was slapped, stripped, and had to carry a cross for a mile plus. He's up on the cross now praying for his enemies that they would find grace and favor in the Father. So obviously, this is a journey. We're not going to get there perfectly. <laughs> Enemy love tomorrow. Um, but we do have a model. We do have someone to come before, and we have models in church history um, so one thing I want us to do, we can split it maybe into groups of three or four, that way you can have flexibility. And I want us to do two or kind of two things, but ask yourself two questions first. The first question I want you to ask yourself in the group, we're going to ask this out loud, who are our enemies? And I want to give space that you can be abstract. You don't have to be personal. <laughs> we can talk about just enemies in America. We can talk about enemies in society. It doesn't have to be personal, but you can get personal if you want to, you feel comfortable in this space. That's the first question. Who are our enemies? And then I had a second question. <laughs> Let me ask that second question. Uh, second question is, then what would it look like? What are the turning cheeks things? And we can brainstorm together as people of God to figure out who are our enemies, who are the enemies of society, who are the Amer enemies in America in Seattle? Who are the enemies? That might be different than the enemies in my hometown of Mesa, Arizona. Um, then what does it look like to show them enemy love? And if we can't show them enemy love, what does it look like to pray for them? And then I want us to pray. Uh, we'll end our time by just praying. You want to pray for them by 